Hello and welcome. We are coming to you live for a very special launch. It's the next batch of satellites in a brand new constellation. It's called OneWeb and its mission is to connect everybody across the planet to high-speed internet. Our mission today is to deliver those satellites into space and uh, I'm joined here in the studio by my technical experts. Uh, David Nemeth is the Senior Director of Systems Modelling at OneWeb, whose satellites we are launching. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, David. Hi, Katie. Nice to be here. And uh, Vincent Baudel is uh, the Advanced Studies Director at Ariane Space. And uh, of course, you're the company delivering the satellites for us. So yes. thank you very much thank indeed. Thank you, Katie. Uh, for coming here with us. So we're going to be, uh, these guys are going to be helping us uh, to understand what's happening throughout the mission. Now, first of all, let's go over to the CEO of Arian Space, Stefan Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our second Arian Space launch of the year, the first one using a Soyuz launcher. Today, the StarSem and Arian Space team is back in Baikonur after seven years far from this iconic cosmodrome. For today's mission, ST-27 Soyuz is all set to perform the second launch of the benefit of OneWeb, one year after the first deployment from French Guiana. Our medium weight vehicle will lift off at 2.42 a.m. The mission will last three hours and 45 minutes with nine separations to deliver the 34 OneWeb satellite on board. They will be separated at an altitude of approximately 450 kilometers into a low Earth orbit before raising on their own to their operational low Earth orbit at nearly 1,200 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. This mission marks the 50th Soyuz launch operated by Ariane Space and StarSem with our Russian partners from both French Guiana and Baikonur. The first OneWeb launch from Russian cosmodromes paved the way for OneWeb global network to become a reality. 19 launches are yet to perform in 2020 and 2021 with Soyuz from three different spaceports, Kourou, Baikonur, and for the first time, Vostochny. I would like to express my gratitude to OneWeb for entrusting Ariane Space and StarSem with the full deployment of their Constellation's first generation. We are proud to be part of this journey and participate in the fulfillment of OneWeb's ultimate ambition, providing internet access for everyone, everywhere. We share the same philosophy, space for a better life on Earth. I would also like to congratulate OneWeb satellites a joint venture between OneWeb and Airbus Defence and Space for designing, integrating and testing these state-of-the-art satellites. They will be the 7th to 14th OneWeb satellites as well as the 144th to 167th Airbus Defence and Space satellites to be launched by Ariane Space. Now, our 50th Soyuz is ready for liftoff, so enjoy the show. Absolutely. Lots of launches there from lots of locations. And today, of course, from Kazakhstan. So we're calling today's launch the Kazakhstan launch. OneWeb has offices uh, in a number of different places, Virginia, I believe, and uh, London right. notably. And the London office are hosting an event today. And all the folks there watching uh, the show. So let's go over to Sue Nelson, who's over there. Over to you, Sue. Yes, several hundred people here tonight, and quite a few of them, and you can see beside me, are wearing matching GNOC outfits. And that's because they're part of the team from GNOC, which stands for Global Network Operations Center. And with me is Alan Hewitt, who's the Senior Manager of Network Operations. So what goes on here in London? So, so in the GNOC, we have two core responsibilities. Firstly, we, we manage the ground assets, do fault detection and recovery. Uh, and secondly, we configure the supply plan that provides uh, service to our customers. 
So, Alan, um, you know, people might be a little bit worried who's managing GNOC here in London at the moment, but that's because you do have a bit of a split support here. Yeah, absolutely. So we started at 7.30 this morning and we handed over to our US team at 15.30. So, so the US team now are firmly in control. So when will London be back in action? So tomorrow's the same as today. We'll be back in at 7.30. Uh, nice and early, everyone. Oh, good. It's, it's quite hard to hear uh, in here. It's quite good. In, and I know you're next to uh, Richard Reed, who's sort of known within GNOC as the man with the plan. Why is that? Oh, because I'm responsible for creating the contact plan. So I coordinate the production and the distribution of the contact plan, which is the scheduled communication between the ground infrastructure and the satellites. So how are you feeling at the moment about uh, this launch? What's the atmosphere like today? We're, we're, we're really excited. We've, we've done this before, uh, but, but there's, nothing like, there's nothing like days like today. And uh, same for all of you? Very excited. Let's go. Well, in that case, let's, um, let's see what your message is then. If you could say something to the people that are watching and also to the GNOC team in Virginia, what, what would your message be? Go! Back to you, Katie, in Paris. <laughs> Uh, well, that's good to hear from everybody there in the offices in London. Thanks very much indeed for that. So we'll be coming back to everybody in London throughout uh, the first few parts of, of our programme today. So we were hearing there from the control centre. We're going to hear now from Adrian Steckel, the CEO of OneWeb, from the control centre in London. We launched six satellites in February of last year, uh, and we've been flying those six satellites now for almost a year. So we've gotten performance out of them that was better than expected. Uh, we've also uh, developed some software changes, uh, and all of those experiences are in the 34 satellites that we are uh, launching uh, today out of Baikonur. And we are going to be on a monthly cadence, and we're going to get to be in service uh, by uh, the fourth quarter of next year. And, and really what this is all about is getting to scale scale of coverage, scale of economics, uh, and this is what we really focus on. We will be a global scale company. So our, our vision for our system is that we are a global system. We have international partners, and we want to work with governments and organizations around the world uh, so that we can offer that connectivity uh, to everyone everywhere. And this is going to be a huge transformation for people uh, in terms of connectivity. You will, unfortunately or fortunately, not be able to, uh, to escape broadband anywhere, anytime. And the OneWeb spacecraft are actually being built, as we've heard, by OneWeb satellites. And they've opened their brand new manufacturing plant, which is in Florida. And uh, they're really revolutionizing things over there because normally it takes anything between a year to maybe three years to build a satellite, depending on the size of it. And they're going to be able to do it two in a day. So let's go over now to the CEO of OneWeb satellites, Tony Gingis. This launch is really the culmination of four years of development and, and making sure that we're ready to actually produce the 650 satellites for OneWeb. So this is the first big batch of satellites that we delivered, and so seeing that launch will really show us that we're on this trajectory to be able to build out the whole constellation. The journey over the last month has really been taking that final batch of satellites, shipping them from Florida to Baikonur. The team there, led by OneWeb with OneWeb satellites and Airbus, put all of those on that launch dispenser, which I think I know people have seen the great pictures of. And here we are today on launch day, ready to see those 34 go up into space. So it's really getting them into operation, which is the most important thing for OneWeb and for the collective team. So what did they do, David, once they finished that batch of satellites? Well, they got straight to work on the second batch, which they're building now. Oh, well, it's, a, it's an ongoing process, exactly. isn't it? So everyone working really, really hard to get this done. No stopping. So um, it's going to take us, Vincent, about four hours to deliver all of our satellites. Remember, we've got 34 of them to, to drop off in space at various different locations. Quite a lot of things are actually going to be happening during that time. So, Vincent, why don't you talk us through what's actually going to be happening? So the, the mission tonight will start with uh, four booster phase, so duration approximately equal to two minutes. 
After the separation, uh, the second fly, uh, yeah, the second stage of the launch vehicle, so the central core, will take the, the reins during less than three minutes. And a few seconds before the, the core stage, uh, the separation of the core stage, the search stage will be ignited. The central core will be then separated, and two seconds later, the fairing will be jettisoned. So nine minutes, 23 seconds after liftoff, the upper stage will be separated from the nose module. So the nose module includes the fregat uh, with its MLI, the dispenser, and the 34 one-web spacecraft. The fregat main engine mission will start with the first ignition of the main engine during more than four minutes to reach uh, an, uh, the intermediate transfer orbit, followed by a ballistic phase lasting 51 minutes, and after that, the second burn to circularize and reach the injection orbit. And then after that, we are on our way to drop off the satellites. So we are going to make nine separations, 19 minutes apart. So we're sort of chugging along like a school bus, going from stop to stop. And as you can see here on the image, the satellites are coming off the dispenser. Um, they are coming off first the top two from the top hat. We call the bit on top the top hat. And then four at a time. So we have a total of nine separations for the 34 satellites. And you can see here the, uh, so you can see the dispenser and then the, the sort of gold spheres on the bottom. That's the frigate, which is actually doing the driving and all of the work um, and actually telling the satellites when to, to go. And the satellite's only job is to let go when it's told. So why do we have 19 minutes, David, between each of the separations? So it's important for us that the satellites all have a little bit of different velocity when we let them go. We want them to sort of spread out after we release them instead of releasing them in a bunch. So what we have to do is after we release the satellites, we have to orient the frigate to burn the thruster, burn the thruster for a very short period of time, just a little kick, um, and then reorient back into position again so that we can reorient, release the, the four satellites in the correct directions. And so it's got to be oriented properly. So that whole maneuver takes a little bit of time. Um, and so 19 minutes is, uh, is the amount of time to give us both the, the right amount of delta V, the difference in velocity, plus enough space between the satellites. And velocity, of course, meaning speed. So um, we call the process of preparing the launcher and the satellites for today, we call that the launch campaign. And there's a whole set of activities that happen during that time. So let's hear about a few of them now. The majority of the team arrived here in Baikonur on January 16th. The satellites arrived on January 17th. And for the first week, the satellites were inspected, the batteries fully charged, and the satellites were integrated onto the dispenser. Uh, January 25th, the uh, dispenser with the satellites was uh, integrated to the Fregat upper stage. On January 27th, the entire stack was encapsulated into the payload fairing and then moved to MiG-40 where it was integrated onto the Soyuz launch vehicle you see behind me. So, yes, I I'd like to thank our, our, our key participants here at the launch campaign. Um, from OneWeb Satellites, who manufactured the satellites, <coughs> uh, Arian Spas, our, our launch provider, uh, with, along with Starsum, um, Ruag team, who's done a great job, uh, and, uh, and of course, all of our Russian partners here uh, at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. So there we have it, uh, pretty cold there in the... Um, in Baikonur at the launch zone. It's... Uh, it's it gets very hot in summer and it gets very, very cold in winter. So the final countdown started about four hours ago, Vincent. Yes, four what's, hours ago. What's yes. now? The State Commission authorized the fueling of the Soyuz uh, with propellant, of course. And uh, this operation was completed one hour and 25 minutes before liftoff. Uh, ten minutes before liftoff, uh, the frigate upper stage has sent its uh, readiness to the to the Soyuz, so the readiness of the upper composite, that is to say all elements inside the fairing. And now we are at uh, five minutes uh, to the liftoff. The beginning of the launch vehicle final uh, automatic sequence will be initiated manually <laughs> with a turn of a, of a key start uh, in start position. So an and operation called uh, Kluchna start, yes. Yes, Kluchna start, which of course means key on start. And uh, Vincent, keep ta talking to us about what we're seeing now, because this is the launch campaign that yeah. we actually discussed earlier. These are some of the events 
that uh, we heard about. So the, the launch vehicle uh, has been prepared in the MiG-40 in, uh, in Baikonur. So the MiG-40 is uh, the launch vehicle integration building. We can see here the, the integration of the first and the second stage of the, of the launcher. In the meantime, uh, we have performed the preparation of the upper composite in the MiG-112. And this upper composite has been transferred to the MiG-40 for uh, its rendezvous with uh, the launcher. <laughs> And we have performed first uh, um, an integration with the Soyuz uh, third stage, and then with the first and second stage. You can see the final, uh, the final integration in this uh, building facility. And it's interesting that the dispenser in there is actually horizontal and is mounted to the frigate on the side. So the mounting and the dispenser itself has to be strong enough to hold the whole thing up horizontally during this integration phase. So last Monday, we performed the rollout uh, in um, early morning. So the transfer from the MiG-40 to the launch pad number six in the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Once arrived, uh, the complete uh, launch vehicle has been vertically tilted. You can see the, uh, the tilting trolley here. And once uh, positioned on the launch pad, the servicing platform has been uh, installed around the launch vehicle. And uh, after we have initiated the uh, launch pad activities and the final uh, operations. And that green structure you can see there around the launcher is called the gantry, the clamshell gantry, because that actually opens out in this uh, direction to, well, sort of in both sides. Uh, shortly before launch, that, that's already open, hasn't it? So just take a look at the launch vehicle. Let's see if we can have a look at it. Uh, it's very dark. I'm not sure if you can see it, but there is actually a big grey mast yeah. attached to that. We call it the KZM. What's it doing? Yes, uh, well, it includes, in fact, the umbilical links. Uh, these links are specific electrical links which uh, ensure communications between the ground and uh, the launch vehicle upper part. So these connectors are separated two minutes and 25 uh, seconds before liftoff and dropped into a, a basket. So we, we, we cannot see this, uh, this operation because it happens behind the, the launcher on, uh, on the screen, yeah. We are two minutes to launch. Uh, let's just talk about some of the things to watch out for. So that big grey mast will retract, move away, pull away from the launcher just before lift off. And then there's another mast underneath it which will also pull away. Let's have a quick word about the ignition sequence, Vincent. We switch the engines on 16 seconds before lift off. Yes, so this sequence consists in a, in a progressive increasing of the, of the stress level. So this progressive sequence uh, enables to check uh, that the engines work uh, nominally. So the ignition 16 seconds before the liftoff, then a preliminary stress level 20% at uh, yes, 11 seconds before liftoff, then intermediate stress level 85%, uh, uh, four seconds before liftoff, yes, and finally the full stress level at, uh, at the liftoff time. Known as PUSK. PUSK, yes. So one minute coming up to one minute to the launch of our satellites, David. This is your second batch about to lift off. So this is obviously remarkable. It's, uh, it's fantastic to see the rocket. I'm excited uh, on many levels. I think for OneWeb, this isn't that we've waited a year for 34 satellites. We've waited for a year so that we could build 34 satellites a month. Okay. Um, so, so this is really the start. And that's, that's, that's very exciting. So 35 seconds to launch. Let's sit back now and watch the launch.
And there she goes. The next 34 OneWeb satellites have begun their journey. They're heading out north over the steppes of Kazakhstan, and Soyuz is pushing hard against the Earth's gravity. Vincent, we're burning the four boosters at the moment and yeah. the engine on the main core stage, but it's really the boosters that are doing the yeah, work right yeah. now. The, the first stage of the launcher consists in four boosters around, uh, around the, the central core, so uh, 45 tonnes each, and each powered by one RD-107 engine, producing, yes, a total thrust of uh, 340 tons at liftoff. So the job is to get uh, the launch vehicle away from, uh, from the Earth, yeah. Because, of course, gravity makes it hard for us to leave. It's the reason why we're able to stick to our planet, but it makes it much harder to get away from it. David, your satellites have lifted off. How are you feeling now? Um, a little, always a little nervous. It's like a roller coaster. You know everything's going to be okay, but... Uh, it's, uh, I'm just very excited to see them up and safely where they're supposed to be. So let's have a look at the tip of the nose of the uh, launcher there. And there you can see the boosters falling away. This is the scheduled moment for separation of our boosters. They burnt all their propellant. We don't need them anymore, so they can fall away. And we're shedding weight. The lighter we are, the faster we go. That's the name of the game. We're burning the... Separation main... confirmed of the booster, yes. And you have separation yeah. confirmed. So Vincent is getting information in his ear uh, from, from the teams in Moscow. So that's good. We can confirm separation. So we're burning the main core stage now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is the flight of the, of the second, uh, second stage of Soyuz, so the, the core stage. And um, during approximately uh, three minutes, uh, and after that, so the... The next stage. Yeah. And, and we, we said you're getting information in, in, yeah. in your ear. Where is that coming from? So it comes from teams in the CVI. So in CVI in French, it's uh, Control Visuel Immédia. So it is an operational team uh, who is tracking the launch vehicle and receives the, the telemetry data from, uh, from the launcher. So they can consequently confirm when the major events uh, have uh, occurred. And at the Guiana Space Centre, the CVI team, uh, have uh, their offices on a hill so that they can receive all the telemetry, the information coming from the launcher. But, yeah. of course, <laughs> on this occasion, they're in, in Moscow in the Mission Control Center there, which I, is known as Tsup. I believe that's where they are. But I, So we were looking earlier. We could see the top of the launch vehicle. Let's see if we can have a look at it now. We call it the fairing. Uh, maybe we can see the pictures of the simulation, simulated pictures. Look at the right-hand side of the launcher, the top of the launcher. The fairing is encapsulating our satellites with their special dispenser, and it's protecting everything inside it from the rigors of the launch, Vincent. What kind of things? Yes, the fairing has uh, several jobs. So most notably, it's uh, protecting the satellites from the severe uh, condition of the launch and atmosphere. So the acoustic vibration uh, at liftoff, so very loud uh, uh, vibrations, and also friction when the, the launcher is uh, flying through the, the dense part of uh, the atmosphere at uh, very high, uh, high speed. Very, very high speed. We're traveling at speeds of kilometers per second. Uh, we will be reaching eight or nine kilometers per second later in the flight. So we're coming up. The next thing that we will be expecting is for the fairing to separate because we're now getting to over 100 kilometers above our planet, which means that the friction which Vincent was telling us all about is no longer a, an issue, and we can separate the fairing. You can see it there. We've also separated. This is also the scheduled time to separate the second stage, and hopefully, Vincent, you'll be able to confirm that for us. But, David, the captain has switched off the seatbelt signs. <laughs> We're in space. It took us uh, less than five minutes to get there. David, you can see your satellites for the first time. Do you want to tell us what we're looking at here? Sure. So what you can see there is the, uh, the 34 satellites on the right and the frigate, 
uh, which they're attacked to, attached to, and we still have the, uh, the third stage pushing it along. But the 32 satellites are all, um, are all held on to there, and the, the, we're going to release them, as you saw earlier, from the top. So first the top two from the top hat, and then the rows going down there. Um, they're sort of this trapezoidal shape, this sort of truncated triangle shape, so that they fit neatly on the dispenser so that we could build the satellite with the maximum possible volume and still fit uh, efficiently a large number of satellites under the fairing for this rocket. So when you say they're a tra trapezoidal shape, um, could, could you say they look like a, a pyramid with the top cut off? Yes, absolutely. Or as I was growing up, it was like a slice of pizza that my brother got to first and took three bites out of the end. <laughs> Very unlucky. What's the separation order? So we are going to start with the top two. Um, and then we're going to work away from the top down to the bottom. Um, so the top two and then four on the first ring and then the last four on the first ring and sort of interspersed. So you get four coming out in uh, right angles to each other in four opposite directions. And how do they actually separate? So the separation is done using a, a very tried and true technique called explosive bolts. Um, and these are actual bolts, like a bolt that you thread onto something and they are actually installed at our factory. Um, and they have a little pyrotechnic in there. And there's a signal that will be sent from the frigate at the right time to explode the bolt. And suddenly, there's nothing holding the satellite in anymore. And there's little springs that push the satellite very gently out. I always think it's amazing, really, because when you see the images on the screen, it looks like everything's traveling quite slowly. But of course, it's all traveling very quickly up there. But what we're effectively doing then is pinging the satellites out into space and giving them that push. A very, very gentle push. When you see the simulated results, it looks very stately. Uh, it's a very calm process. And David, can you just talk us through the parts of the satellite? Sure. If we could pull up the picture of uh, a OneWeb satellite. So this is a picture of one of the OneWeb satellites after it's been deployed. So when it's in the uh, dispenser, the, the, the antennas are folded up and the, uh, the solar panels, the wings there are folded up as well. When it comes out, everything is going to deploy. Um, and the, you can see all here all of the important parts that, uh, that make the satellite work. So you've got the solar panels on the outside, which generate the power. You've got on the bottom this sort of deck of cards fanned out look. Those are the user antennas. Those talk to the user terminals on the ground. Um, and then the two sort of round TV dishes on the top there that look sort of to me like butterfly antenna, I can't get that image out of my mind, are what attach to the gateway. So, and there's electronics in there to boost the signals through from one antenna to the other. So it's a very, uh, it's a very I don't want to say a simple design, obviously a lot went into it, but there's a certain uh, economy of design that went into these satellites to get them so small. Vincent, have we had any information yes, yet? Yes, we have some confirmation. So I, we confirmed that the, the Soyuz uh, works uh, nominally. So we are now in the um, third stage flight and everything is uh, nominal. So when we say everything is nominal, of course, that's, that means that everything's going according <laughs> to plan. Yes. Which is great. So we're coming up on the next the next stage or the next scheduled stage, which is the third stage separation. And I just want to, you may have noticed when you saw the launch vehicle on the ground, there's actually a sort of a lattice section, an open section between the, the second and third stages. We call that a hot stage technique because it, when it separated the second stage, it actually switched the third stage on first before it separated the second stage. But this is now the, Scheduled moment to separate the third stage. So we are shedding weight again at the third stage, shutting its engine down. That's what it looks like up there. And we're really starting the next phase of the journey now because the frigate upper stage, which is that gold structure that you can see, is going to take the wheel. And it's getting ready to switch its engine on, isn't it? We call it the pre-burn. Yes, and uh, we confirm the separation of the upper composite right now. So there is now a pre-burn of the, of the frigate, the first step, yes. Uh, during 55 seconds, uh, it's given a quick burst of acceleration to push uh, the fluids back in the tanks. So uh, like when you accelerate uh, uh, in, the, in the car, in fact, you get uh, pinned back uh, against uh, the seat. So uh, after that, we have the ignition of the main engine, 
and uh, during uh, four minutes, and this first ignition, yes, is performed to inject the nose module into an intermediate transfer orbit, which is uh, an elliptical orbit. So let's just talk everybody through that for a second. So uh, we have the, at the moment, we're going to be going on an elliptical orbit, which is, um, go, oh, you'll have to excuse my bionic hand, by the way. <laughs> Why don't I, I should... take this one, Katie? <laughs> yes, you start you... off here, and you launch up, and then you need a kick to get you into elliptical orbit that will go around like this, take us halfway around the world, and then we get to the top here, we have another burn that will make this elliptical orbit into a circular orbit. Yeah. So that's the reason why we are switching our engine on Right exactly, yes. to, to get us into that orbit. So, 11 minutes and 14 seconds into our flight. David, we drop off your satellites at 450 kilometers above the Earth, but of course that's not their actual final destination. They're going to have to travel further. We will be seeing that later, and we will be talking about that later. Um, they're going to be travel traveling on their own for about 750 to 700, no. They'll be traveling They've, to 1,200. 1,200. So they'll have to travel 750. Yes, further than last time. Yes. So um, let's see how our satellites are going to get there and what they're going to do when they actually get to their final destination in space. The following animation shows components of the OneWeb system design. Unlike geostationary satellites that operate at an altitude of 36,000 kilometers, the OneWeb system operates at 1,200 kilometers, resulting in significantly lower latency and better system performance. Our system will provide full global coverage, which is shown here. The gateways are shown here in red. The teardrops moving around illustrate the OneWeb satellites in orbit, which will communicate with the gateway infrastructure for connection to the internet. End users will connect to the satellites via OneWeb user terminals. As satellites pass over users, the terminals represented here by a white dot will hand off connections between beams and then to the next approaching satellite. The resulting connection and connectivity will provide high-speed access as shown in the download simulation here. Any news, Vincent, on our... Last news is confirmation of the pre-burn uh, for, the, for the frigate, yes. So that's good news. So, D David, it does seem that there's an awful lot more to your system than simply satellites. That's right, and we've been doing a lot more in this last year other than, besides building up these satellites and building up the satellite factory. In fact, if you show the image on the screen, um, we have... Do we get the image? Maybe, maybe not. Um, I was going to show an image of one of our ground stations. Ah, there it is. So we have an image of our ground stations here. Uh, this is one in Florida. We have over 40 around the world, and we are in the process of building these out. Um, so in addition to all of the high-tech and space and whatnot, we have uh, some concrete and water lines that we need to deal with. And these, these are actually all pointing straight up because they're not being used. That's known as the birdbath configuration in the, in the satellite dish world. Um, but when they're actually used, you will see them nodding back and forth as they track the satellites flying overhead. So we're coming to the next phase of our flight now, which is the switch off of the, uh, the uh, frigate engine. And we're going to be entering what we call a ballistic phase, yeah, so which is going to be... And this is the scheduled moment yeah. for frigate to switch its engine off. That's what it looks like. The frigate is the gold structure and the dispenser or... or Adapter, as we sometimes call it, is mm -hmm. what we were looking at there. So we've entered the next phase, Vincent, which is called the ballistic phase, which, am I right in saying it means no um, power? Yes, this is a, a phase without uh, propulsion. So we are traveling high enough and fast enough uh, to cruise without the, the engine. So during this phase, uh, we optimize the orientation of the, of the launch vehicle in order to ensure the, the best condition for the frigate, but as well for the, for the satellites. 
and the duration of this ballistic phase is uh, quite long. It's uh, 51 minutes. And we confirm that uh, the first ignition was completely nominal, yes. That's great news. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I, I can imagine that the folks in London are very happy. They watched that launch. It was a very beautiful launch. So let's go back over to Sue Nelson now in London and get some reactions. Over to you, Sue. Thank you. Everyone here in London is delighted with the progress so far. And when you think of OneWeb, you automatically think of connectivity. And I'm joined by Ben Griffin, who is the lead on the commercial aviation team. So how do airlines benefit from OneWeb satellites? Well, there's, um, there's lots of ways that airlines benefit. If we think about uh, the passengers themselves, and the proliferation of, uh, of connectivity with devices, um, airlines are kind of struggling to meet the demand of more and more passengers who want to be connected throughout their journey. So providing greater capacity, greater bandwidth, greater coverage uh, is certainly going to help um, uh, meet the needs of airlines and their passengers. And the other perspective as well, the modern airliners um, are producing more and more data which if they can get that data off the aircraft in a more timely manner tells us more about the aircraft, how they're performing and the routes they're flowing. So there's, there's no end really to the, uh, to the benefit we can get from getting the data off the aircraft and providing more capacity in order to do that. And it's not just the airline industry that's going to benefit either. No, no, that's right. So it's not just the airline uh, industry, it's the aviation community as a whole, so business jet, uh, military um, and other applications, but also the maritime sector is phenomenally, phenomenally big, has a big uh, need to be connected. Uh, enterprise applications, uh, which was very well suited to, to OneWeb, uh, providing connectivity in places where there just isn't connectivity today, and providing and opening up new kinds of applications and services that benefit from the low latency that, that OneWeb can provide. Um, uh, as well as that, other government types of um, government types of applications as well, um, and not just industry providing connectivity to schools and healthcare and, and other things like this. Which, and scientists, because you're going to, you know, provide coverage to the Arctic. Coverage to the Arctic, exactly. So, so places where there isn't connectivity now, all of a sudden, opens up a whole new uh, capability. Uh, through, through the connectivity that we'll provide. And so how do you work with organizations and sort of letting them know that this is, this is what you can do, this is how we can expand what you're doing? Well, th things like this, uh, the launch obviously helps and that's a good platform to do those things. Uh, working with, with leading industry partners to, um, to, to help champion what we're doing and get the message across. And of course, attending industry events where we can carry our message directly to the markets that we want to serve. Uh, Mobile World Congress is coming up in Barcelona in, uh, later on this month. Um, aircraft Interiors in, uh, in late March, early April, and the Satellite 2020 in DC in, in March as well. So all these, all these key things where we can get our message across to industry and making the use of uh, events like this to, uh, to, to get our, our message across, yeah. Now, it's not, um, you know, telecom satellites, most of them, we think of them in geostationary orbit, but OneWeb satellites are going to be in low Earth orbit. What are the advantages of, of, of being in low Earth orbit? If, if, we start with the, if we start with the pure physics of it, the uh, low Earth orbiting satellites, as the name suggests, are much, are much closer to Earth. So we have a lot less distance to travel, which means the, the latency is, is less, which means the messages can, can, uh, and the data can flow much quicker between, between the satellites and, and their intended destination. That opens up a whole new load of applications, cloud applications, gaming, uh, other time-sensitive things. Uh, I mentioned healthcare before, for example. Um, there's, there's a lot more coverage we can provide across the globe, so we can, we can do the entire globe now without any holes, which simply isn't possible with the geostationary satellites. And actually, we benefit from, from the ability of, of, of uh, replenishing the satellite, uh, the spacecraft assets more frequently as well. So there's all sorts of different things where LEO is, is uh, low Earth orbit is, is highly advantageous compared to geostationary. And you're making some differences on the ground too, not just in space. No, that's that's right. Yeah. So um, because we're new and we're able, we have the uh, the luxury of, of uh, a, a whiteboard, effectively a blank whiteboard. We can build the new systems, the new billing systems, operational systems to make sure 
that we can cater for and adjust to the market as it develops. So we're not restricted by old old things like that, equally uh, embrace technology on the ground much more readily and, and, and make sure we can pivot and adapt to the way the terrestrial world is going, which is, which is moving at such a pace, it's, it's, it's a good thing to be able to keep up. Well, thank you very much indeed, Ben Griffin. Back to you, Katie, in Paris. Thanks very much indeed, Sue. We're going to take a break now in our programme for about 40 minutes or so, and we'll come back to you um, at 10.41 UK time, 10.41 London, that's 11.41 here in Paris, and in Baikonur, that's 3.41 in the morning. We'll see you then.
Hello again. We are coming to you live from Paris and we are one hour into the launch of the next batch of 34 satellites in the OneWeb constellation on their way to their final destinations in space. And joining me here in the studio, we have David Nemeth, who is from OneWeb. Hi, David, David, thanks for coming back for the next part. And we have Vincent Baudel, who is from Ariane Space. Ariane Space responsible for launching OneWeb's satellites. So right now, the satellites are riding bareback on board what's left of the upper stage hurtling through space at phenomenal speeds. But not with the wind in their hair. <laughs> not with the wind in their hair. And let's just uh, check in and see what's been happening. Vincent, uh, talk us through. This was the launch. We lifted off one hour, one minute and 20 seconds ago from the pad at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And I have to say it was a really beautiful launch. Yeah, outstanding one, yeah. Uh, the mission started with, uh, yes, with the liftoff, yes, yeah, and we're going to see off. some images in a minute. But this uh, launch itself, this was the replay of the, of the launch. Okay. And we actually saw the four boosters there. You can see those burning. And what happened next, Vincent? Yes. Yeah, so after the, the boosted phase. Um, uh, the second stage of the launch vehicle so took the rain during uh, three, three minutes. So a few seconds before separation of the core stage, uh, the third stage was ignited, yes. And the central core was then separated. So, and two seconds later, the fairing was jettisoned. So the velocity achieved at that time is uh, 3.6 kilometers per second. After the flight of the third stage and its uh, separation from the nose module, the velocity achieved at that time is uh, 7.2 kilometers per second. So the frigate upper set took the wheel with a first ignition of its main engine during more than four minutes to reach the intermediate transfer orbit, followed by a ballistic phase uh, without propulsion, lasting uh, 51 minutes, and a second ignition with a shorter duration for circularization and injection into the spacecraft separation orbit. So that's what's been happening up until now. And we've still got a few more drop-offs on our school bus to go. But before we do that, let's go back to London and see how everyone's getting on over there. Over to you, Sue. Hello and welcome back. Well, among the guests here at the OneWeb watch party are some of the students who took part in a recent space hack at Imperial College London. Now, around 100 students took part. It was sponsored by OneWeb, and they were all sort of divided into teams. And what they had to do was to provide solutions to some space industry problems. Now, one of the organiser of that was Jarwed Adele. He's a fourth year engineering student. He's also the president of the Aeronautical Society at Imperial College London and he's here with me now. Um, those uh, problems that the team had to solve, give me an idea of some of the problems. Of course. Firstly, I'd just like to thank you for having us here and thanks to OneWeb for inviting all of us at this wonderful launch event. But, so to answer your question, right, um, Essentially, the space hack was about finding creative solutions to these pain points within the space industry. And more specifically, with this partnership with OneWeb, the focus was on um, these low Earth orbit satellite constellations. There were five main challenge streams, namely satellite operation, satellite engineering, um, satellite enabled world, responsible space and commercial. To give you a brief description of just a few of them, uh, for example, one of them sought to find innovative solutions to the problem of space debris that we have today or more seriously you might have tomorrow. Um, another was how to um, monitor each one of these individual satellites in a 600 plus feet of constellation. And another um, a a favorite one of mine was actually how the satellite connectivity all around the world 
would help unlock new business potential in developing nations. So as you can see, these were all varied um, problem statements which just asked for a creative solution. So the emphasis then was on the creativity. Exactly. Uh, it was en involved engineers, science business people from the sound of it. So it was quite interesting because um, the reach that we had, the event that the event had, it was not only aeronautics students from our department, but there were people from physics, um, there were people from computing, and even people doing an MBA in the business school. And also, there were not only people from Imperial, but outside, there were Cambridge, Oxford, King's, and um, UCL as well. So it, was, it had a wide range of people. And which, which team won in the end? So it's a team actually within the aeronautics department. There were a team of second year students. Um, their solution was to this prob the problem of space debris. Um, what they essentially devised was this module that they decided to call Spider-Man, which stands for Space Instrument for Debris Removal and Maneuvering. Um, and that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Now, before we go, because we're about to hand back to Paris, um, what do you think about OneWeb very quickly, the fact that they brought you here? Do you think it's encouraged students to... Uh, to be a space industry? Absolutely. Uh, I must say it's encouraged myself to want to work in the space industry, right? Brilliant. Well, that's it. From the students, back to Paris. Oh, that's, that's great to hear. And the more students we go get coming into the space industry, the better. So uh, that's good work from you guys there. And thanks very much indeed for telling us all about it. Coming up to the next big event now. This is the scheduled moment for us to switch the engine on of the frigate upper stage for its second burn. Burns for, what, 24 seconds? It's not a, a very long time. And we have been... I just want to ask you about, Vincent, the, uh, during the um, coasting phase that yeah. we were going through earlier, we've now switched the engine on, so obviously we're no longer coasting. We were doing what we call the barbecue mode, so that's literally turning <laughs> as if on a spit. Yes, Why? yes the barbecue phase. So it is, in fact, a, a spin-up mode. Uh, it corresponds to a, a, an, yes, a rotation of the, of the nose module around its uh, longitudinal axis. So it is a, a, a maneuver which enables to optimize the thermal condition and the sun illumination of the frigate, but uh, of course uh, of, the, of the satellites, yes. Because I guess really it's fair to say that when you're facing the sun, it's very, very hot, and when you're away from the sun, when you're in space, it's incredibly cold. So uh, OneWeb satellites are mass-produced uh, spacecraft, rather like cars on a production line, and it's great to be part of something so new. We take it for granted that we have internet, but not everybody has access to that right now. So what we're doing is putting that network of satellites strategically positioned so that we can reach those areas that currently don't have access to the internet. I really like the idea of being a part of a company that's trying to bring satellite coverage worldwide and the entire process to try to be the company that's the first to mass produce satellites successfully. It's pretty amazing because we kind of went from nothing to just beautiful white floors, not being able to build anything, to actually having satellites. And now the satellites are fully tested. We have satellites up there that are already performing really well. So now we're just going to keep building our constellation. OneWeb has staffed with the most experienced technicians. Like we put together a team of over 100 operators very quickly and leading them and getting them to build like quality products. We're kind of all hand-picked. We have a great experienced five-star team. My name is Doug Hudson. I'm a launch operations technician. I retired from the Air Force in 2007. I'm Gwendolyn Sisto. I'm the operations and planning manager at OneWeb Satellites. It was like they had written the job description for me. I studied aerospace engineering, aeronautics, and astronautics. My name is Florence Trin. I'm the integration and test lead for OneWeb. My dad was my inspiration. He is the reason why I am interested in engineering and math and, and the space program and space. OneWeb Satellites has five apprentices, and I'm just one of the five. So we're working specifically on the manufacturing of the satellites. It's been a long time planning, preparing, doing pre-tests, uh, dry runs, and making sure that this process is efficient. We kind of have a saying, make it happen, Captain. 
And we've been working 10, 12, 14 hour days. And to get the second launch out is a big accomplishment. I like getting in on the ground floor. It's exciting. There's a little bit of competition there with, with some of the other companies in the area. Well, it's been pretty awesome. I mean, look, I'm here at Kennedy Space Center at the Antonov behind me. I mean, where else would you get to do this? It's such an international company. They're very accepting and very open to everyone. And I think that's really beneficial. It's exciting times and it's cutting edge. When I thought about aerospace, I never thought about this. This is something that's revolutionary and something that's really exciting. We're just like scratching the surface of what's possible. So now we've built this whole machine that makes the machine that can be used for all these other applications. We're basically bringing the cost down for space and making it more accessible for the rest of the world to like touch it. Uh, some very exciting people there with some very big brains. Um, now, the frigate upper stage is getting ready to release the first two satellites. That's going to happen in just under 40 sef seconds now. We need to position them very precisely, don't we, Vincent, so that they can push the satellites into space on a very precise orbit. Yeah, so we need to put the, the satellite in the right uh, attitude so, so they can separate. So to do that, uh, Fregat performs a, a very carefully planned of set, uh, set of maneuvers sorry, uh, by means of small thrusters which constitute the attitude control system and we call this, uh, this set of maneuvers the orientation phase, yes. And there we can see what it looks like up there, the separation of our satellites, our first two satellites from the top hat, David. That's right, dropped off at the first bus stop at the corner of Spruce and Elm. <laughs> you were telling us about, well actually, uh, over just south of Madagascar, actually, yes. rather than on the corner of Spruce <laughs> and Elm. Um, David, you were telling us earlier about the separation bolts that allow those satellites to be pinged into space or pushed gently into space. I gather that you visited the factory. Yes, yeah, so I went to the OneWeb factory. I had a, a fantastic time there. Everyone was very tolerant of me, going around and poking my nose and everything. Um, and one of the things that I got to see was the last stages of the process. So, so one web satellite finishes the satellite and they give it to us and it's our job and our partner's job, Ruag and our Spas, to install these bolts. And so I actually met Florence, who you saw in the video earlier, um, and I saw the process by which they, they, uh, they put the bolts in. Um, and so I just wanted to shout out to Florence. They just fired, should have just fired. Hopefully all went well. Um, we'll find out about that soon. Um, so what was the process like? So it's this great process where the satellite comes down onto a, 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 a sort of a fixture thing and they're, they're all busily installing stuff and, 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 uh, and putting things in there. Um, but there's one part that really kind of uh, stuck out to me is we have this, this coating over, not this coating, it's a, it's a blanket, MLI blanket. It's like a Mylar blanket like runners use. And it's very precision cut to fold exactly over with everything in the right place. Um, when we get the satellite, it's not all finished and buttoned up because we need access under the blanket in a couple of spots. So after they've installed everything, the last thing that they have to do is they have to go through and finishing buttoning it up. And they really have like these little button things. <laughs> And they're going through and they're buttoning up the MLI blanket. And it's like, a, it's like watching a kindergarten teacher buttoning up the kid's coat <laughs> so that he'll stay nice and warm when he goes outside. Before he gets on the bus. Before he gets on the bus. And uh, I guess uh, that would be his father then rather than the, than the teacher. Yeah, maybe, yes. And the, um, it always amazes me in space, uh, Vincent, some of the things that you were talking about. Actually, things seem very complicated, but at the end of the day, it's down to, it's down to engineering and bolts and nuts. And Let's just talk a little bit, though, about how we're finding out information. You're hearing stuff in your ear, but how is the rocket talking to us and how do we know what's happening up there in space? Yes, yeah, so um, we, have, uh, we have a team in, uh, in, uh, in Moscow. Um, uh, yes, in Moscow, in the Fregat uh, Flight Monitoring Center. So they got, they get, um, yeah, they got the information from, from the launcher, the signal from the launcher, um, when it's possible, that is to say when we have uh, visi visibility. They got the data from the launcher and they assess this data to see where we are and if uh, Everything work, works uh, nominally. So that's uh, what's 
is happening right now. The telemetry, as you say, you have big dishes in the various different telemetry stations, all dotted along the flight path, picking up the signal from our launch vehicle as it flies over and sending that information back to us. At the heart of the OneWeb program and the OneWeb ethos is a program to connect schools. Connecting schools has always been important to OneWeb, but let's find out what does that actually mean? The theme for this next launch is space for everyone because one of the main purposes of OneWeb is to connect the unconnected. So that uh, connecting school is, is, is a core mission of the company and it's really where our business and our, our, our purpose, our vision can come together. We want to connect every school in the world because we want to connect every person in the world. And it's important to us that we um, connect in, uh, not only uh, schools in, in populated areas but in the most remote and unpopulated areas. You may remember our first launch had six satellites and we went to six very remote corners of the world um, and got six schools to name the satellite. Um, we want to help um, make sure that the skills are there for the next generation to use connectivity to get an education and then to, to do jobs anywhere in the world. When people hear that it's a satellite constellation, they assume they need to be engineers or, or, or uh, somehow in a STEM field themselves. But I, I always point out that I'm a lawyer and I trained as an actress. And it's important to the company that they have people with, with a wide range of skills. And we encourage everyone to get the skills and apply for jobs at, at our company. I think everybody who works at OneWeb is driven by this same mission, this connectivity, the idea that we are about to uh, revolutionize um, the world's uh, access to information in the way that the internet did 20 years ago or smartphones did 10 years ago. Um, this is going to give everybody that same kind of access and the people who've come to join OneWeb uh, are all excited about this potential of being, of being in the first wave uh, of the new way to communicate. And this time last year, Arian Space delivered the first six satellites for OneWeb. That was in February last year. And those six schools all played an important part, didn't they, in that launch? Yes. So the, uh, the six schools that, uh, that Ruth mentioned actually named the first six satellites for us. Now, we have too many satellites to name at this point. So, um, so it's, those are special that they got a name. And I just sort of wanted to let everyone know and let the children who named them know that those satellites have been very hard at work for us this past year. What have they been doing for you? So they've been, uh, obviously, the first thing that we had to do with those six satellites was validate the performance of the satellites themselves and of the design itself, right? And they did spectacularly well. They met all of our expectations. Um, and once we got through the phase of making sure that everything was okay on the satellites, we really needed to put them to work testing the rest of this complex system, right? So you have ground stations which need to track them, you need to send communications links over them, and so the satellites are an, in, an incredibly valuable part of our test program, and will continue to be those six satellites. Now we'll have an additional 34 satellites to add to that, and, and more and more will go on. Um, so, you know, in addition to testing the communications and testing the payload and everything works, we've flown them up to an altitude, we've moved them down again, and so uh, we've really checked them out to make sure everything is okay, and they've given us the confidence to move forward with this mass production. So let's go, go back to how we're getting the information from our, our launcher. We were talking about telemetry. I, incidentally, telemetry is an interesting, an interesting word because it means from, it comes from the Greek, tele, of course, remote, <laughs> like uh, television, and me measure, metri, the metry section comes from the measuring. So we're measuring effectively from a distance. Um, Let's talk a little bit about those tracking stations, and I think we may be able to show a picture of those. Yeah, so in order to, to know uh, the launch vehicle position, how it works, yes, we need to get information and signal, so this is the telemetry. And telemetry is got by, you know, by means of a ground tracking station and a specific dish. Uh, we have tracking station along the flight path, of course, and as of 
today's mission is very long. We have not a full coverage uh, from the ground station. So that's why we need to be under ground uh, station visibility in order to receive information from the launcher and then confirm the completion of, uh, of the key events like uh, separation. So tonight we use uh, ground station Russian network. So we, have, uh, we can see the picture. We can mention, uh, of course, by Kono, uh, Vokuta, Plesetsk, uh, Krasnoye Selo, and so on. So this is uh, the, the, net, the network sorry, uh, used tonight to track the, the launcher, yes. And of course, Plesetsk is also a launch zone in its own right. And so, yes, of course, it has the telemetry station there as well. And let's go back to, because you were telling us about the the way the satellites are released and they're on the special dispenser which i have to tell you that the last time david and i did a show together which was a year ago we thought it looked a little bit like a corn corn <laughs> on the cob um but that i never that, heard the end of that back at the office yes he had he had some <laughs> corn on the cob on his desk when he came home um but but it is actually very seriously a, a, a very specially designed dispenser, isn't it, to host these satellites? Yeah, so uh, the objective was to accommodate uh, 34 spacecraft or 36 uh, for uh, the Vostochny uh, launch uh, on top of the launcher. So uh, a totally new, a specific carrying structure was needed uh, to be developed and manufactured, uh, especially for, for the one web mission. So, a dedicated dispenser has uh, consequently been designed to perfectly uh, integrate the OneWeb uh, spacecraft, so electrically and mechanically. Me me mechanically. Sorry. I'm going to help you out there. So <laughs> we're going to go... and ensure the, the, and we, the release. Sorry. We're going to go back to our children now and look at their ambitions for the future. Am I? I am one child waiting to be connected to the internet, to the world, to you. One wish waiting to be fulfilled, one dream waiting to come true. Who am I? I am one story. Waiting to be told. One life. Waiting to be shared. I'm one inventor. Or teacher. Or leader. Or creator. Waiting for the technology to take us all one step higher, 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 higher. I'm one transformer. Waiting for change. I'm one of the most remote parts of the planet. Waiting to welcome you. One place you've never been. One face you've never seen. I'm one pair of hands waiting to build the future. One pair of eyes gazing up at the sky. One school amongst millions. One child waiting for one day when all children will be connected as one. And that day is not very far away. Right, let's get back to what's happening now. We're one hour, 24 minutes and six seconds into the launch, David. Do you want to give us a recap on what's happened so far? So far, we have uh, done our first release of two satellites. We have swung over Antarctica, we released the satellite south of Africa. We're coming up the east coast of Africa, ready to drop off the next two um, over Saudi Arabia. Of course, the satellites we released are still traveling with us, and they're actually a little bit ahead of us now. Um, oh. So we have a little string of satellites ahead of where the dispenser is. Oh, why are they ahead of you? They're traveling a little bit faster than you. So when we do a, a, the burns that we're doing in between actually slow us down a little bit. 
Um, and that's the way we space them out. So you end up with a little uh, marching of the little satellites ahead of the dispenser as it goes. And when it's all released, the dispenser will be back here and all of the satellites will be up there. The opposite of the Pied Piper. Exactly. Duck wa ducks walking backwards. Ducks walking backwards. <laughs> and Vincent, what about the frigate upper stage? What's so, it doing during this time? Yeah, so we have um, a sequence uh, identical between each uh, each uh, separation. So the duration of this uh, sequence is uh, 19 minutes and consists in a series of, uh, of maneuvers. So first there is a, a tilting of the nose module to the required orientation for the, for the Fregat attitude control system boost. Uh, this, uh, this boost with very small delta V during few seconds to ensure enough distance between the, the spacecraft and, uh, and avoid any collision. After a new tilting of the nose module to the required orientation for the spacecraft uh, separation, then the separation ordered by Fregat and uh, a smoothie separation uh, of, the, of the satellite uh, themselves. And of course, we have to remind ourselves, we were talking about there, there are satellites, but satellites need to be flown and operated. And it's the teams in the control center at the OneWeb Control Center in London and also Virginia or just London? London fly and Virginia, just like the GNOC was talking about, have, they have two shifts in London and Virginia. We have two uh, operation centers for the satellites, one in London and one in Virginia as well. So they will be concentrating, I'm guessing, very hard at this point. They are concentrating extremely hard. They've been very busy. So the last time they had to pick up six satellites. Now they're going to have to pick up 34. So their workload has gone up by uh, six times. Um, and then every month they're going to have to pick up more. So they've been doing a lot of preparation and a lot of automation to make all of this happen. Although I must point out that they still have enough time to answer the questions that I've been asking them in preparation <laughs> for this show. So. Well, that's, that's Thank good. Thank you, Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear. But um, I guess they also do a lot of rehearsals, is that correct? They do, yes, they do a lot of rehearsals. They have accurate simulators of the spacecraft for the rehearsals. Um, and of course, they've been practicing a great deal on the satellites that we've got. So those first six satellites um, have been uh, a great test bench for everything and all of the systems that we've got to run and fly the satellites. So it's been a good year and, and very successful, hasn't it, so far? We're getting closer now to the next frigate upper stage switching its engine on. Again, back into that pre-burn we were talking about, pushing the fluids back in the tanks. And here's the images. We can see the computer-generated images up there in space. How do we get these images, Vincent? So um, this is a, a simulation, a simulation with uh, representative models uh, of, the, of the launcher, the dispenser, the satellites, of course, and considering the trajectory data, Prediction coming from mission analysis perform uh, in, in the frame of the preparation of the mission. And each step of the flight are then uh, perfectly simulated. So we have seen uh, the boosted phase, uh, the stage separation as well, the orientation sequence. And now we, we will follow the, the spacecraft separations. And each time we switch our engine on, we actually switch it on for a shorter time. Yes, Why is that's that? that's right. So we want to have, every time we switch the engine on, we wanted to give it the same change in speed, but the engine only has one thrust. It's like a car that you can only press the accelerator down all the way. Um, and because it's getting lighter and lighter, because there's less satellites, you need to press the accelerator down for less time to get the same boost of speed. So we're on our way to our next bus stop. It has to be said that our bus doesn't actually stop. It does keep on going, and it separates the satellites and pings them out into space as it's, as it's flying, hurtling through space at speeds between 7 and 8 kilometers uh, per second, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, per second, not per hour. So that is unbelievably fast. I haven't calculated what that is in, in terms of uh, hours. But the, the next thing is the separation of our next two satellites. Four uh, satellites. Four satellites, four satellites, Thank satellites you. now. And, of course, we will hope to get telemetry confirmation when we go back into the range of the tracking yes. station. Yes, sure. Um, so... One minute 
coming up to, we're due to separate our next four satellites in, at, in uh, one minute and 30 seconds, one hour 30. So we're, we're coming up to that. And we're, we're heading out over Saudi Arabia. What's our flight path? Just remind us where we are now. So we're heading north. Uh, we will be over Saudi Arabia when we release these four satellites and uh, continue to head up over the North Pole. I um, mean, because we are going north and we're going back over Russia, we're going back in telemetry range after the separation. And we're keeping, uh, our flight path is effectively taking us up over the North Pole. North Pole to South Pole. So up to South Pole. So we'll get telemetry con confirmation when we're up here. And then as we come down here, we will have another four separations outside of right. telemetry range. And then we won't get confirmation again until we've come around again. So this is our first, uh, first confirmation of, uh, our first chance to get confirmation of the separation. So we've done how much of a lap? Have we done a full lap of the Earth yet? Almost, almost. We are just, we don't come back to the same place. We come back a little west each time. Is that because um, the, the Earth's moving? The Earth or has is that turned that? a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. So what, in, in the hour that we were out there uh, taking a break and having a coffee and maybe a cigarette, um, the Earth has turned enough. So we're now coming up west of Baikonur um, in, in minutes. And this is what it looks like up there, the four satellites moving away. This is the scheduled moment, moving away. And the frigate had to position us so that those were all going in the right directions. We couldn't just release them anywhere. We had to get in just the right project, project, uh, position and orientation. And the frigate, of course, if we can just have another look at the images there of the 3, 3D computer-generated images. The frigate is the gold structure at the bottom, and the dispenser, our cob, with its corns, <laughs> is, the, is the structure on the top of it. So, right, it, it would appear that we've now had our next four satellites separated, but we haven't got confirmation of that yet. But what happens to the satellites? What do they do, David, once they've been separated? So before we ship the satellites, we charge up the batteries. And when we plug them in, it essentially shuts down the satellite um, so that the battery is conserved and we have time to set up and put it on the rocket and spend that launch campaign days. Uh, once you fired the bolts and the springs push it off the electrical connection to the to the to the dispenser is separated and that's a signal for the satellite to wake up so the first thing it does is the computer boots up everything today starts with the computer booting up my television has to boot up when i turn it on so just like that our satellites boot up um, come up, and the first thing that they will do is they will deploy the solar panels. They have a special circuit, a very clever little circuit, to, uh, to, to melt a wire to deploy the solar panels. And then they will turn and face the sun. So like a plant, you want to get as much energy you can. Instead of leaves, you have solar panels. So you rotate towards the sun and get as much power as you can, and you just sit there, and they wait. Sunbathing. Sunbathing. Now, Arian Space is very experienced at launching constellations of satellites. Let's take a little look at that experience. I would like to take the opportunity of this one web first launch of the year to highlight the skills of INSPAS engineering and operations team in support of our customers for the constellation development and deployment, whatever the launch vehicle. The one-way mission is a concentrate of what INSPAS can bring. In the early phase of the project, ability to understand the core business of the customer to come with the appropriate concept. Then, while preparing the mission, co-construction with the customer of launch solutions and mission design addressing key mission requirements, such as spacecraft injection altitude, number of spacecraft per launch, or separation sequence. A dedicated organization has been set up in our space to meet the many challenges of the program and to be able to ensure one launch per month during the deployment phase. Regarding launch vehicle, Soyuz was the adequate solution to answer one web requirements to deploy about 650 satellites within a two year period time frame. Soyuz launch vehicle fitting to Constellation's needs has been already demonstrated with more than 15 launches performed to low Earth orbit missions for other Constellation's programs. The Fregat upper stage versatility associated with the dedicated dispenser allowed to perfectly answer to the OneWeb mission requirements. 
Arianespace and Starsam offer was based on the capability to operate the Soyuz launch vehicle from three launch pads, one in French Guiana, one in Kazakhstan, and one in Russia. This unique opportunity provides higher flexibility and reliability for the benefit of work. Launching from different launch sites will secure the deployment schedule, which is key to OneWeb, and this without preventing to serve other customers. For OneWeb, we developed as well a smart dispenser to operate, carry, and separate the various spacecraft. And we provided engineering support to spacecraft manufacturers to optimize the spacecraft dispenser design. To make the customer experience in operation as smooth as possible in preparation of the launch, we finally reduced the operation duration in the launch preparation facility. Pre-integration of satellite on the dispenser at the factory to shorten the activity at the launch sites, allowing the high launch rate of one per month requested by OneWeb. OneWeb dispenser is a flexible and modular product. This made very easy its adaptation to the specific configuration of BS21 with six spacecraft and four mass simulators. In the same way, we are currently expanding its capacity to 36 satellites for the next flights. Finally, I would like to highlight the very good collaboration between OneWeb, Arianespace and RuxSpace, which allowed to develop an innovative product, answering challenging specifications. As you know, multiple customers have already entrusted Arianespace in deploying their constellation on the various launchers operated by Arianespace, with structures provided by CASA, RUAG or Ariane Group. 2020 will be also the opportunity for INS Pass to demonstrate its ride share capacity with the first SSMS mission that will soon be launched on VIA. To conclude, I would like to warmly thank the OneWeb team for their trust, thank my team for its professionalism, thank RUAG and our Russian partners team for their continued support. We look forward to continue the deployment of OneWeb Constellation on Soyuz and on the Ariane 6 maiden flight. So we, we've been hearing, we've been talking a lot about constellations, obviously because OneWeb is a constellation. But for anybody who's unfamiliar with the term, what it actually means is you've got basically more than one satellite. So it, you can have two satellites in a constellation. You can have 10, you can have 20. OneWeb's going to have over 600, 648, I think, at, at, at some stage Something you'll like have. That, yes. But it's, uh, I have to tell you, that is an awful lot of satellites. So that's a, a big constellation of satellites. I guess it takes the... The, the, the name from the constellations. Um, so we've seen there how Ariane Space is really well adapted to, to launching constellations, but why? How? <laughs> <laughs> so for more than, uh, than 20 years, um, Ariane Space, yes, has developed a, a real know-how and experience for constellation deployment. So for such a specific mission or objective, uh, is first uh, to co-design with the customer uh, the launch solutions and mission by addressing uh, key mission requirements, that is to say spacecraft injection altitude, optimization of the number of the satellites, and the separation sequence. Um, the interest and advantages of our offer for the OneWeb constellation is also the possibility to propose and use three uh, different launch pads uh, such flexibility enables to ensure a very high uh, launch rate. So the pilot launch has been performed from Kourou uh, in French Guiana last year in February. And tonight we perform the first launch uh, for the OneWeb constellation from, uh, from uh, the Baikonur uh, Cosmodrome. So and then there will be uh, 19 other Soyuz launch from Kourou uh, by Konur and uh, Vostochny. Okay, so finally, I would say that uh, the flexibility of the Ariane space offer is ensured uh, by its fleet of uh, launch vehicles, Ariane, Soyuz, Vega, and thanks to their uh, complementarities, this launcher cover all the all the constellation mission requirements. Uh, so uh, a heavy launcher as uh, Ariane 5 can propose launch solution for a very high number of satellites, and um, and lighter launcher like uh, Vega can propose solution uh, for smaller constellation or for completion or, uh, of uh, an orbital plan or for spacecraft uh, replacement. And of course it has to be said um, that the Ariane, the new Ariane 6 launch vehicle will be, uh, the first launch will be 
your OneWeb satellites, are the, another batch of satellites, obviously. Thanks very much indeed for talking us through that, Van Sol. Well, let's go back to London now and see what's happening over there. Over to you, Sue. <laughs> Thank you. Now, as you can hear in London, there's still quite a lively atmosphere here this evening. And this time I'm joined by Sara Mugnani, who's a payload engineer for advanced projects for OneWeb. Now, Sara, could you just remind us what the uh, role of the antenna is, as you are a, an antenna specialist? Um, well, yeah, the antenna is part of the payload. Uh, the payload has the work, say, is what pays the bill, is the value of the satellite, is what uh, get the information from one part of the globe to the other part of the globe, is the electronic on board, and then you have the antenna, which is at the end of the payload, is what transform basically the, the digital uh, added value of information that you have on, on board of the satellite in electromagnetic waves that will be then transmitted to Earth to, the, to where they have to go. So it's, the payload does the routing and then the antenna get the job done and deliver to where it has to go. Now, the payload on the OneWeb satellite is quite unusual. In fact, I, I'm not sure I've seen one like it before because you expect the antenna to be, you know, like a dish. normal... Yes, like a, a dish. And this one is sort of concertinaed. Uh, yeah, it's quite peculiar as a design. It was basically... It's made of little rows, and, uh, and then is what makes the particularity of the antenna because uh, usually an antenna is generating a round low a round beam on earth like if you have a torchlight and you illuminate something you're going to see a round uh, blob uh, what the antenna on, on, on one web spacecraft does is it generate a, a beam that is, is like a sliver and instead of being round it's elongated and that's because you have to blanket it the whole earth with it so basically it's all about efficiency and having it as, as efficient as possible, as light as possible, as low power as possible. So the design is really about efficiency. Now the um, antenna on the OneWeb satellite is fixed, like many satellites. Yeah. Where do you see the future? Uh, so well, in the future, the, the design of the antenna on the OneWeb satellite is very advanced anyway. But yeah, obviously for the future, we are looking at the future technologies, so active antennas. Um, the future is for beams to concentrate where the capacity is to, to leverage the possibility to give to the customer what they want. So uh, lots of advances to, to yeah, be seen yeah, in the working future. Working on it, yeah. <laughs> You're working on it indeed. Yeah. Um, uh, Sara Mugnani, thank you very much indeed. And um, are you going to be here for quite a while still? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, back to Paris um, from a, a marvellous watch party in London. Over to you, Katie. Oh, thanks very much, Sue. It looks like everyone's had a great time there, and that was the last time we'll be going to, to Sue and the gang in London because it's, well, it's half past 11 over there, so they'll be winding their party down for now and uh, picking up the rest of the information. Um, so we are going to hopefully now get a mission update from the CEO of um, Aaron Space, Stefan Israel, and we're waiting to hear from him I just wonder if he's there now. Maybe we'll just, maybe we'll just hang on. We'll just hang on a little bit because he hasn't come yet to the to the microphone. So we'll 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 hang on for that. I tell you, I wanted to ask you, David. We were talking earlier. We heard uh, from the gang in London there, the, the students, the about the space hack project and the debris, which was fascinating to, to hear about. I know, I know this is a subject that's close to your heart as well, isn't it? Space well, first debris. of all, can I say on behalf of anyone who was once a 12-year-old boy that anything named Spider-Man is going to be cool. Um, but debris is seriously a very big problem. Um, and as we launch these, and launch these mega constellations, it's something that we all have to take very seriously and we all have to take responsibility for. Um, the, the view of OneWeb, you know, we have, we have a motto, leave no trace in space. 
Um, and essentially what that means is that everything that goes up has to come down again. Um, that has been true for millions of years on Earth until we started launching stuff into space. And we discovered that it just stays there and stays there and stays there for a long time. And in the early days, they would just leave things there. And those things are still orbiting today. So, um, so we've done a great deal, I think, in order to, to make sure that we are responsible citizens of space. Um, you know, big things and little things, right? So one of the examples that all of our orbital planes are about four kilometers apart, right? And the idea is that the satellites miss each other. So even if one of the satellites loses control, we don't expect that to happen, right? But occasionally accidents happen in space. And if you lose control of two satellites in two different planes, they have a chance to collide with each other if they're at the same altitude. So by separating a little bit, it means that objects in different planes, even if they go into this defunct state, which we're not expecting, um, will continue to miss each other for a very, very long time. Um, we also have all done all of our mission planning around not just bringing the satellites up, but having enough fuel to bring them back down again um, and to do it more quickly than the regulations require. So, you know, traditional regulations require a very long period of time that things are allowed to loiter in the space. Um, and we're trying to do things much, much more quickly um, because we recognize that if we pollute this orbital altitude, we're hurting ourselves as well as everybody else. Uh, indeed, and it's our planet and we need to look after it. The atmosphere is very much part of our planet. It's our, our gas mask and the space around our planet is important to us. So it's good to hear that. And of course, the launch vehicle or the frigate upper stage will be deorbited as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. So uh, after the, the, the last uh, satellite separation, so, so the ninth one, uh, there will be a new ballistic phase, but after that, there will be a, a, a third ignition of the frigate main engine to, 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 to deorbit the, the, uh, the frigate and the dispenser and to perform a re-entry. And the drop zone is located in the Atlantic uh, Ocean. And that will occur very quickly after this mission ends. So before you wake up in the morning, the frigate will already be out of space uh, and it will just be our satellites cruising up there. So, so, something else I wanted to ask you about, David. We launched the first six satellites uh, a year ago on a Soyuz launch vehicle. We launched it from the Guiana Space Center. David w was lucky enough to come out to French Guiana and ex experience the, I the mosquitoes. It. <laughs> <laughs> and the sun. And the sun. Vincent, of course, has been there many times. It's the European launch zone, which is where we launched three different rockets from. And Vincent was telling us all about those earlier. We're building the new site there as well, of course, for Ariane 6. Uh, but, but, but before we come on to that, We've, talked, we've touched a little bit on uh, this has been a very good year for you because you've got six satellites in space and you've learnt from those satellites. Uh, building a constellation from scratch is quite, a, uh, is quite an awesome thing to do, isn't it? So what makes it, yes, absolutely. It's, it's a phenomenal challenge. and It's really that challenge, I think, which for a lot of the engineers has drawn us to this project. It's just a fascinating problem because... Um, you have to build the satellites, of course, and we've done a, you know, change the way that you build satellites. Um, but there's a lot more to it than the satellites, as you saw, right? And so um, one of the things that you have to do, so one of the questions you might ask is, I build all these satellites, how do I know what I'm actually going to get, right? In such a complicated system, in such a complex system, how do you figure out what it is that you're actually going to be able to deliver? So we actually have a very uh, extensive systems modeling team. This is the team I run at OneWeb. We're not the only ones who do modeling by any means in OneWeb. We've got orbital people and people doing all sorts of things. Um, but the core mission of my team is to make sure that we understand exactly what should be happening, when it should be happening, um, and that we understand if we want to say we have a bunch of airplanes flying around and they all have certain kinds of antennas and they have certain kinds of data plans and the satellites are flying a certain way, um, that they get that we understand what they're going to get and that we can make promises to our customers about what they're going to get. 
Great. Well, thanks very much for explaining that to us, David. And it has. It's been a great year, hasn't it? Yeah, and I'm really fantastic. pleased pleased for you and pleased for everybody at OneWeb. So we're going to head back to London now and back over again to Sue because I said it was the last time we were going to see them, but actually they've got more to tell us. So let's go back to you, Sue, in London. Welcome back to London. And I'm joined by Vikas Grover, who's the Chief Information Officer at OneWeb. Now, you gave quite a, a rousing speech to all the employees at the, at the start of this watch party event. How important is this launch for the company? Thank you very much. Um, this, this launch is very special for us um, in the sense that this is the first time we are actually sending out 34 satellites in one go. Uh, so in our previous launch, we had six satellites, and this is the 34 satellites. The important thing here is the satellites are getting produced in the manufacturing line in Florida, right? And, and this is the manufacturing line which is producing hundreds of satellites for us, which will become the, the new norm of the future. So this first satellite launch starts to create the, the rhythm for us for multiple sort of launches that are actually going to happen this year. So success now is, is a great step forward. Uh, the second important thing to keep in mind is the, the community which is actually looking at this as, as technology opportunity, business opportunity, is actually keenly watching us. There are people who are interested in investing in our businesses. They want to see successes coming out at this point in time before they actually make their decisions. And so success here now is fairly key. And this, in my mind, is, is a giant step for mankind because we are actually creating broadband on Earth, which is powered by space, which is not the norm at this point in time. So I feel that this is going to be... Um, this is going to create a good future for us. Uh, we have a number of engineering designs that are now coming alive. So putting 34 satellites on a single dispenser is a marvelous engineering content, concept and, and design. And now you actually see that coming alive. Releasing these satellites in different orbits and in, at different times and ensuring that we are able to listen to these satellites once they are released is another engineering um, uh, marvel that you're actually now starting to see. So for us, this is a fabulous moment, uh, and success here actually creates huge success going forward for us. Now, what um, I found quite interesting from the people I've been speaking to this evening and surrounded by is that particularly the GNOC team earlier on, that they're, they're quite a, it's quite a young team, a young company, yes. in terms of its employees. It's fascinating you say that. So even though the satellite technology is fairly old, uh, and we've had 60, 70 years of satellites, the, what you start to see now is the emergence of a new age for satellite industry. Uh, and we now see um, assembly lines, uh, which are actually manufacturing satellites, or two a day, three a day, versus um, satellites getting produced in the past, which were like one would get produced in seven or eight months, right? You, you now see, because of the, the pace of change, because of the change in computing cap capabilities, because of the change in the way the networks are now connected, more younger people are actually on the horizon, and this is about software, this is about engineering and, and deep engineering for space. So, absolutely, I mean, people who are running operations are always young. Uh, but what you find in the satellite industry is, is actually uh, the emergence of the young talent which is actually going to take us to, to, the, to the future. Key things here is this is not about launching a satellite. This is about maintaining the sanctity of space. This is about ensuring space is clean. This is about ensuring all the designs work well. So fascinating time for us and uh, the guys from the uh, Satellite Operations Center, the guys from the GNOC, um, the guys from systems engineering from OneWeb actually doing a fantastic job, and I'm really proud of them. Well, it's, there's certainly, a, you know, there's still a lot of excitement here, here tonight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, 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 we are, we are we're not only excited, I mean, uh, we've done a significant amount of heavy lifting in the last 12 months, right? Uh, some of which I actually spoke about earlier, but there are, there are aspects around uh, now getting user terminals uh, set up, we have setups done uh, in Palermo where we're now testing the user terminals and connecting them to the satellites and actually driving uh, 
uh, the, 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 the capability of connecting high-speed broadband with the mobility ethos of connecting airplanes, boats, ships, um, and, and, and providing an experience that uh, will truly be a marvelous experience for mankind, and that's, that's the way I look at this. I mean, in, in, in my mind, this is, a, this is a similar junction that we, we, we saw when we saw mobile phones starting to emerge early in the 90s. I see this as a very similar cycle taking shape um, in, in, in 2020, and hopefully uh, this will be the launch of uh, a technology and, and an experience that we will all be proud of. Well, best of luck in, in the future. Vikas Grover, Chief Information Officer of OneWeb, thank you very much in, you. indeed. And uh, now back over to Paris and Katie in the studio. Thanks very much indeed, guys. Yeah, and as, as he was saying there, we're certainly on the verge of a lot of new and very, very exciting technologies. One of the new things that's happening for Ariane Space is the Ariane 6 launch vehicle, which you were telling us about, Vincent. So just to fill everybody in, at the Guyana Space Center, which is in South America, on the northeastern tip of South America, it's the European launch zone. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment they're building, you guys are building a new launch pad, a brand new launch pad for the Ariane 6 vehicle. How's that coming along? Yeah, so a new launch pad uh, fully dedicated to this new launcher, so uh, uh, to, for, for, to, to uh, Ariane 6. So uh, everything is uh, uh, almost completed, so ready to, to, to to initiate the, the first campaign. So we have a, a new launch pad with a, a, a complete new uh, mobile gantry um, to welcome the, the Ariane 6 launcher. So the Ariane 6, Ariane 6 sorry, maiden flight is forcing uh, this year uh, with uh, 31 web satellites. Um, so we, in fact, we, we, we keep some yes, performance on the, from, the, from the launcher. Uh, that's why there is only 30, 30 spacecraft on top. So there will be 30 spacecraft on top. So we, we keep some um, performance uh, for the other objective of this of the mission of this maiden flight. So uh, we have uh, we have other objective validation and uh, of different maneuvers, uh, validation of reignition, validation of uh, different things to prepare the next uh, the next mission for this new launcher. And you've seen that launch pad, haven't you? You've I actually did. visited it. I've so, driven past it, but I haven't actually been on it. So I got to visit it last year. It was not done. Um, but one thing I can say that impressed me much is that it is enormous. I mean, the, uh, the, the flame, what are they? The flame, not, they're not trenches for this one. They have a, a different structure there. Ah. But these enormous construct structure. Um, and you just, you get the feeling that something very, very large is about to come in. There um, and so it's. I think it's an exciting rocket for us. I think we you know we are when you're launching a lot of satellites. It's always nice to be able to launch more of them, um, even though we're not doing it on this one. Obviously, the the, the capacity of this rocket is yeah, much larger. Yeah. So um, I think it's going to be a, a fantastic uh, a fantastic launch for us to see. Just to, just to, as an engineer, just to see the impressiveness of the size and the scale of that. I've been to the launch pad, the Soyuz pad had in French Guiana, which I must admit was a really wonderful experience to see it. But what I found really remarkable was that there's a little tiny bush right by where the launcher goes off. And that bush is thriving. And I, I, we would imagine that it would get burnt by the fumes, but and the fuel, the, um, you know, by the ignition. Yeah. But no, it, it, it certainly doesn't. So we're hoping now that we might be able to go over to Stefan Israel. We're still waiting to, to hear from him from our, our mission update, just to, to check in and see how things are progressing. And I'm just going to have he's a... He's not yet in telemetry range. He's still coming around. <laughs> and hopefully <laughs> soon. So Stefan is now ready. And I'm going to hand over to you, Stefan Israel, the CEO of Ariane Space. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, 
So I come to you to uh, announce you and to confirm you that uh, the six first satellites of the missions have been uh, targeted as planned. And uh, we have just had uh, by our customer OneWeb the confirmation that uh, they have sent signal. They are in good uh, health. We are now waiting for the confirmation of the deployment of the solar panel. But up to now, everything is 100% nominal. You know that we have seven more separations to occur up to the end of this mission. At the end of this mission, we will have separated 34 satellites. But now, I just wanted to tell you that everything is going uh, as planned and that we have already outstanding news of the separation and the acquisition of the six first satellite of tonight's mission for OneWeb. Thank you very much. Good news, then. We have confirmation there of separation of the first six. It does, and it sounds like we got contact with them from our SOC as well. So that's great, and good news from Ariane's side. Uh, yeah, Arian's so first side. step, uh, successfully performed, so it's great. So we are all looking forward to the next one, yes. This is, this is the exciting part. The, ro <laughs> the rocket is dramatic, but hearing from them, that's the exciting part for the engineers. Absolutely. So we're going to take a break now because the satellites are going to the school bus. It's going to keep delivering the next few batches of satellites, and that's going to take another, from now, about another sort of hour and 40 minutes it's roughly and we're not going to follow that on air we're going to come off the air and come back to you again in roughly an hour and 40 minutes keep your eyes on the screen and join us back then for the separation of the last the last four satellites and hopefully we'll then we'll be able to declare the mission as success but we will see you in about an hour and 40 minutes bye for now
Hello again and welcome back. We are three hours and 40 minutes into our mission, which is to deliver 34 satellites for the OneWeb constellation into space. I'm here with my studio guest, Vincent Bordel, who is from Ariane Space, the company delivering the satellites, and David Nemeth, who's here from OneWeb. David, why don't you bring us up to speed what's been happening over the last hour and 40 minutes or so? So while we've been uh, drinking coffee and having a break here, the uh, frigate has been hard at work. Um, it has made another, it has made another, it has been scheduled to make another five stops, separations three through eight uh, on its mission. It is now coming up to do separation number nine. Um, and we have confirmation that separations three through seven have, uh, have been confirmed through telemetry. Uh, we have not yet gotten confirmation on eight, uh, but that has been uh, scheduled to happen. And, so far, so good. Great. And here we've had the switch on of the scheduled switch on of the frigate upper stage. That's the gold structure you can see there with the uh, dispenser attached. We call it a dispenser. You can also uh, call it a, uh, an attachment mechanism. And mm. um, th actually, I think frigate is a really fascinating piece of kit, isn't it, Vincent? Because it's, a, it's the upper stage of the launch vehicle, but it's very clever. It can do lots of stuff. It yeah. can turn its engine <clears throat> on and off. The Russians have, uh, have designed a lot of interplanetary vehicles over the years, and they've used that technology to design the frigate upper stage. And that makes it very versatile, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the frigate upper stage is a... Uh, um, restartable uh, upper stage, so up to seven times, and uh, offering a great flexibility to servicing uh, a wide range of orbits and allowing delivering the, the payload to different orbits uh, in case of shared launch. So its flight profile is adapted to the orbits required by uh, our customer, but also adapt to the configuration of the of the upper part. So, for example, for GTO mission, the typical profile for frigate is a direct injection profile with a single frigate burn. I'm going to just interrupt you there. So, when yeah. you say GTO, you mean geo transfer yeah. orbit, which is an, an, an orbit Sorry. that takes you to geostationary orbit, which is 36,000 kilometers above the Earth. Yes. Uh, for circular orbit, um, or highly inclined uh, orbit, the typical profile is an intermediate orbit uh, ascent with two burns. And in case of multiple launch, uh, several frigate burns can be performed to transfer the payload in a wide uh, variety of uh, final orbits, providing the required plane changes and orbit uh, raising. So let's, I wonder if we can see the CGI images that we have, the, three, the 3D simulation images, so we can actually see the frigate upper stage, because it would be interesting to explain to everybody what it's made of, it's, it's that gold structure there. What's on board? Yeah, so the, uh, you can see the, the MLI envelope uh, all around the, the, the frigate upper stage. So uh, inside there is, uh, in fact, it consists in six spheres. Uh, you have two spheres for the avionics and four for the storable propellant. So you have two tanks. Uh, with uh, UDMH, so it's uh, unsymmetrical dimethyl uh, hydrogen. Goodness, yes, a long name. <laughs> <laughs> and two tanks uh, with uh, NTO, that is to say uh, nitrogen uh, tetroxide. And these are the, the fuels or the propellants which which are pro effectively propelling us. David, we are up very late, as you mentioned. Uh, we, the coffee cups are building up <laughs> upstairs in the green room. And the cigarette butts. <laughs> <laughs> For some people. And why are we up so late tonight? So that's an interesting question. The last launch, as you remember, was a very reasonable hour. Um, plenty of time to go to a party afterwards, and it is now, what, two in the morning here in uh, Paris time? And I'm just going to interrupt for a second because this is obviously the scheduled moment now to separate our uh, last batch of four satellites. That's what it looks like. They move away from each other, diametrically opposed. I guess that's designed to stop them from bumping into each other, amongst other things. That's right, and to make sure that they all go with the right velocities. But back to your question about why we're up so late tonight. Um, so the interesting thing is that we have what we want, ultimately, is a constellation with 12 different planes. So satellites going in 12 different orbits, evenly spaced around the Earth. So when you launched 
The first satellites, you could do it at any time, and it was fine. But we already have six satellites up there, and they are now in plane number two. And we are launching in plane number 12. So what happens is you want to launch the satellites into the plane. So as the Earth turns, you have to, if this pl is plane number two over here, and this is, this is Baikonur, right? As Baikonur comes around, we want to launch when Baikonur is under plane number 12. Well, that's only going to happen at a certain time of day, actually AM and PM. So if you want to do that, you have to make sure that you have launched at the right time when you've come around so that you can have the correct orbit. Now, you can shift planes. It's a procedure that takes some time. Um, and we'll occasionally do that for some of these launches. Um, but generally, you don't want to do that for very long or very far. So uh, as these launches go on and on, the times will be kind of all over the map, depending on which plane we're launching and in which month we're doing the launch. Well, and, and that's going to be fun to see. Um, so let's take a, another break now, because we are, um, well, three hours and 47 minutes in, and we're going to be waiting now for the confirmation, because as Vincent has explained to us earlier, we are going in and out of the range of the tracking station, so we're going to wait now to go into the range of the next tracking station before we can find out what the latest is on our mission. So we're going to come back to you in just over an hour to find out how it all went and uh, we'll see you back back here in just over an hour bye for now
Hello again and welcome back to the Kazakhstan launch of 34 satellites to their orbit 1,200 kilometers above our planet. They are, of course, the OneWeb satellites and they lifted off from the pad over five hours ago. We are going to go to Baikonur now to hear from Stefan Israel, the CEO of Ariane Space and uh, Adrian Steckel. Over to Stefan. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Ian Space and Starsem are delighted to announce that the 34 satellites entrusted on the Soyuz launch have been safely separated as planned on their targeted lower orbit. This first one one launch from the Russian cosmodromes is a bright success for all our partners, Ariane Space and our Russian partners. Congratulations to all. Tonight, we celebrate the 50th Soyuz operated in partnership between Ariane Space, StarSem, and Roscosmos, and we celebrate the second launch of OneWeb. I would like to address my warmest thanks to OneWeb CEO, Adrian Steckel, and his teams, who do not count their efforts in the work towards the full deployment of OneWeb first generation. Thank you, Adrienne, for being with us tonight and for sharing this great event with us. Adding to the inaugural mission last year in French Guiana, this 27 mission from Baikonur is another step towards making OneWeb global network a reality. Tonight, this launch also opens a series of up to nine other launches in 2020 for the benefit of OneWeb. We will have up to six launched from Baikonur and Vostochny, two from the French Guiana, and I shall also mention the Ariane 62 maiden flight by the end of the year. For having manufactured and delivered the 34th spacecraft to Baikonur in a record time, let me also congratulate the Constellation's prime contractor, OneWeb Satellites, and their teams in Toulouse and Florida. I would like to thank Tony Gingins, CEO of OneWeb Satellites for his renewed trust and for being with us tonight. We are looking forward to receiving and launching many more of your satellites. Ladies and gentlemen, for its return to Baikonur after a seven years gap, Ariane Space and StarSem are delighted to celebrate here a new success, the second one of 2020 for Ariane Space. Baikonur being so closely linked to Kazakhstan let me first address my deepest gratitude to the Kazakhstan delegation led by Mr. Zuma Galiyev, Minister for Digital Development, Innovation, and Aerospace Industry. I would also like to thank another distinguished guest of ours, Mr. Dimitri Rogozin, General Director of the Russian State Corporation Roscosmos. Your involvement means a lot. The Soyuz collaboration is stronger than ever. For sure, such a success wouldn't have been possible without all our Russian partners. Let me thank Roscosmos, as well as Klavkosmos, RKC Progress, and Peo Lavochkin. Fregat did a lot tonight for this mission, and thank you. From Baikonur to CLG, what a successful team. I would also like to mention the fact that the dispenser was made by RUAG. RUAG is a shareholder of Ariane Space. RUAG is a key player of Ariane, thanks to the fairing, and we are very happy that RUAG has made the dispenser for the OneWeb satellites. Of course, I would like to pay my tribute to all my StarSem and Ariane Space team. As I have said, we, were, um, we, were, we have been a bit uh, away from Baikonur since seven years, and we are very happy and proud to be all together back in Baikonur tonight. So now I would like uh, to uh, welcome on stage uh, Adrian Steckel, CEO of OneWeb. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you to everybody who's here. Uh, and I want to thank uh, Soyuz uh, and Ariane Espas for putting up and organizing the Soyuz launch that we had. Uh, for us, it's a big day. Uh, 34 satellites went up 
uh, the separations uh, were done, we can sense all the satellites. Uh, and this is an important step in deploying our full constellation. Uh, and uh, we'll be back in Baikonur very soon in the month of March uh, with our next batch, which is getting produced uh, and will be being shipped out to Baikonur uh, between the 17th of February and the 20th. And that's a testament to our assembly line uh, approach uh, and the success of our factory. And this is really a tribute to everybody at OneWeb Satellites, uh, all of the uh, personnel at uh, Roscosmos uh, and RNS Plus that helped us, uh, and a great team effort at OneWeb also. Uh, we're, we're getting there and uh, can't wait to be in service to, uh, two years from now. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and uh, thank you, Stefan, for your kind words. And we look forward to continuing our deep partnership with Ariane Espas, uh, as well as with uh, Soyuz. Uh, and I can see Tony has just gotten here. And uh, anyway, it's been a terrific morning uh, and uh, uh, a lot of stuff for us to do. Get ready for the next launch uh, right away. Uh, thank you again. Tony? Thanks a lot, Adrian. Um, look, it's a really exciting day for uh, the, the larger OneWeb venture, and I think OneWeb satellites being part of that, we're just privileged to, uh, to be part of it. Uh, thrilled to see the launch last night. For me, it was my first night launch, so it was a pretty exciting thing. I think the uh, excitement that everyone felt, I was feeling as well. And uh, as I said, when we saw the satellites on the dispenser in the film that we saw yesterday, it was really amazing. So I, I just want to say thank you to uh, OneWeb. I think it's been an incredible opportunity that we've had in building these 34 satellites. It's just the beginning. It's not the end. And uh, so we have a lot more to go, but we're, we're ready for it. And we're, we're into batch two already. So we're excited about that. And, uh, and I just want to thank Ariane Spas for a great ride. It was uh, so far so good and everything's looking well. And uh, we're just happy to uh, take it to the next level and continue to support OneWeb and building out the constellation. So I want to thank everyone um, and uh, just say, uh, you know, bon voyage on to, the next, uh, on to the next batch. So thanks a lot. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again for having shared uh, this uh, exciting uh, moment and night with us. I would like now to announce our uh, third mission of the year, and uh, we will be back in French Guiana on February the 18th. It will be with an IAN-5, and we will have uh, the honor and the privilege to deliver for two long-lasting uh, customers of uh, IAN Space the Japanese customer SkyPerfect GSAT, it will be the satellite GCSAT 17, and the Korean space agency CARI for GeocomSat 2B. So uh, it will be from the French Guiana, February the 18th, and it will be another great story. Thank you so much. So great news there. Uh, our satellites, they're on their way. That's good news for everybody. The teams have done extremely well. And we know that we have the next launch coming up on the 18th of February, as uh, Stefan just said to us. Now, we were talking earlier today about the constellations, because Arian Space has uh, a, a, a long history of launching satellites for constellations. You were telling us how well uh, adapted Arian Space is for that. So let's go over to a film now and get some facts and figures about the different launches of constellations from Arian Space. <laughs> She 
So it's mission accomplished once again today uh, for Ariane Space. OneWeb's next 34 satellites are on their way to their final positions in low Earth orbit. And so huge congratulations to everybody involved in today's launches. Big slaps on the back all around. I hope everybody feels very, very proud of themselves. Um, everyone's worked so hard, haven't they, Vincent? Yeah, so the, the tonight mission for Soyuz was absolutely fantastic and outstanding. So. I am thinking uh, of my colleagues in Baikonur and uh, in Moscow, um, the Iron Space and Stars and Teams, and of course all our Russian partners and friends, so congrats to all of them. And of course, David, we, we must say our very best wishes to everybody on the ground and the control centres who are now taking on the job of flying the satellites because our mission's finished, we've delivered them and their mission is just beginning. So yes, absolutely, we're very excited to get started with this and thank you to RN Spas for delivering them safely. Much appreciated. <laughs> so, well, it's time for us to say goodbye now. And uh, thanks for joining us live here in Paris and at the Baikonur Cosmodrome. And until next time, from me, Katie Haswell. And me, David Nemeth. And me, Vincent Baudel. Goodbye. Goodbye. goodbye.